you will be open to start with a poem or something that speaks directly to the heart of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you so very much, friends. Uh, salam alaikum. Shalom aleichem. Uh, may the peace of God enfold us all and uh, purify our hearts. Uh, may that wave of peace unite us and uh, wash away whatever is keeping us from discerning that unity uh, that makes us whole, that binds us to one another, to every living creature in the universe, and ultimately to the keeper of the stars. Uh, let me begin with a short prayer, and it's also an aspiration and a goal uh, for this conversation. Uh, anytime you have a chance to share some words and some teachings with friends, you hope that we leave that gathering um, kinder, uh, gentler, and uh, more aware of our interwoven existence. So this is a prayer poem. Sometimes a poem can be a prayer uh, from the South Asian Sufi mystic Hazrat Anayat Khan. And it goes like this. Beloved Lord, almighty God, through the rays of the sun, through the waves of the air, through the all-pervading life in space. Purify and revivify me, and I pray, heal my body, heart, and soul. Amen. Before we begin our conversation, Amid, do you, I, I would like to give a little bit of a context or setting for our conversation that speaks to the reality of this moment that uh, that brings so much pain and suffering for for the world thank you thank you um you know we live in very strange days and um sometimes it's said to be a chinese proverb or a curse, <laughs> may you live in strange days. And these are surely very strange days. Um, and for some of us who have been active, both in spiritual communities and traditions, uh, as students, as um, participants, in some ways as teachers, and also who feel a calling towards addressing the suffering of humanity. And in fact, see those two traditions as one tradition. Uh, these are very strange days. Uh, they're not unique. They're not unprecedented. Nor are they localized in just one place on our very small planet. Uh, we could just as easily be having a conversation about the Sudan, about Yemen, about Congo, about Myanmar, Kashmir, so many places, including our own country, which is entering a very strange year. <laughs> and no matter how certain events in November turn out, it's going to be a pretty strange year. Um, but the reason that we are coming together and I suspect the reason that many of our friends are tuning in to listen is that there is something about the particular developments unfolding, tragedy, fiasco, disaster, genocide, you can use lots of words, uh, in Palestine and Israel, and a suffering which did not begin on October 7th, but re-emerged to the world consciousness on that day. Uh, and now we're going on five months of, of this. Um, it's tempting to always wish to 
list some numbers. It's always tempting to want to say things like, on October 7th, um, 1,200 Israelis were killed, the majority of them by Hamas, and some by um, the actions of Israel's own military. The uh, Israeli response to that has been um, of a massive scale, in some ways unprecedented in our lifetime. Uh, what we know is that 27,000 human beings have been killed, the vast majority of them women and children, uh, 12,000 children. It's the single largest disaster for children anywhere in the world. Um, and that number, frankly, is probably significantly higher because the entire medical infrastructure of Gaza has been intentionally and deliberately destroyed. Um, there used to be 36 hospitals in Gaza, and every single one of them has been destroyed by this Israeli attack. So Palestinians have no way of even counting the dead. Um, most, many of the bodies are under rubbles, and there's no one to dig them out and give them a burial. Um, and United Nations and UNICEF have called Gaza a graveyard for children. Um, it's tempting to sort of get lost in the numbers. Uh, sometimes thinking of what other atrocity can we think of to compare it to. And there's a time and place for that. I think what I sometimes like to do is to try to remind us that every single human being uh, is a recipient of the divine breath. As the Prophet Muhammad says in our tradition, that the life of every single human is more sacred than the temple of God. Right. Every single human, regardless of gender and race, ethnicity, religion, more sacred than the Kaaba. Uh, that's really the zenith of the tradition that gives shape to my life and to the life of the vast majority of people in Gaza. So I think what I want to do is just to share um, three lives and then to come back and ask that question through a conversation, through a listening to each other. Um, what does love have to say at a time like this? What does love with justice have to say at a time of such utter devastation and destruction? And what does it mean to speak about love? And so here I'm going to um, make very transparent my own moral and ethical and spiritual commitment. If we attempt to hold two truths together, and um, sometimes people get very impatient with them, and I ask you to wait for both. And the first one is to say unapologetically that every single human life, bar none, without exception, is luminous and sacred. Every single human life, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and the flag that flies over your head is made in the image of God and is luminous, sacred, and beautiful, and is of exactly and identically the same value. That a Jewish life is no more intrinsically valuable than an Arab life or an Arab life over an Indian life. 
To some people, that sounds like a kind of, if you would, all lives matter <laughs> statement. Um, and that's where the second part comes in, the second ethical stance, which is to say, all lives do matter. All lives are luminous. Every single life is sacred. And there is a vast asymmetry of power, of privilege, of presumed worth in our world. Certain lives are treated as if they matter more. We saw that in our own country, and I speak as someone born and raised in these United States of America. That's the reason why we needed to have, and we still need to have, a Black Lives Matter movement. Because for 400 years, people of African descent have been treated as if their lives matter less. So to insist that Black Lives Matter is not a negation of the fact that white lives, Asian lives, and other lives also matter. It is a correction to the fact that historically, Black lives have been treated as less than, and in some cases, subhuman. And when it comes to the particular, I'm going to use the word here, genocide, in Palestine, Palestinian lives for over a hundred years have been treated as non-entities, as subhuman, um, and that continues. We hear that in the old colonial language of the British, who in somehow bestowing somebody else's land to European Jews who were being heavily persecuted did not even refer to Palestinians or acknowledge them, but only called them non-Jews, non-Jews who made up 96% of the place. Uh, we see that kind of dehumanizing language in the official statements of the corrupt Israeli leadership, people like Netanyahu, uh, who refer to Palestinians as uh, human animals. And we also see it in the official statements of the presidents of the United States, who in marking a hundred years of this extraordinary suffering, released a statement in which he referred to the loss of life among Israelis, but had not one word to say not one, about the suffering and the death of Palestinians, which was on a significantly greater scale, nor were even Palestinians named. So that's the second part of that ethical commitment, is to say every life, each and every life is luminous, but we are dealing with a vastly asymmetric situation of one of the wealthiest countries in the world, Israel, which is a nuclear power, which over the course of the last two generations has received over $300 billion, that's billion with a B, of U.S. political and material and military aid. And on the other hand, an occupied and oppressed people, the Palestinians, who before October 7th were living in what human rights agencies were calling an open air prison. So there's that extraordinary asymmetry, which is mirrored in the way that we talk about the casualties, the fatalities, the human beings whose lives have been stolen. Um, in those first few weeks after October 7th, if you were to turn on American news, you would see a wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Israeli families mourning and grieving uh, their 
loved ones, their dead, and the hostages. There has simply been no corresponding version of that on the Palestinian side. So on one hand, their loss of life on their side is 20 times greater. That loss is politically and financially enabled by the United States. And we simply do not have opportunities to see them as members of our own human community. So that's what I want to just start with and then get to love and justice with these three humans, each one of them more sacred than the house of God in Mecca. Um, so here is a picture of this girl who is on the front page of the BBC today, Hend Rajab, six-year-old girl. Um, the car that she was in with her family was attacked by the Israeli Defense Force, killing her family. She survived, and for three hours, she was on the phone with the Palestinian rescue staff, ambulance services. Uh, her very last words were, come and get me, the tanks are very close. Uh, twice the Palestinians sent an ambulance and the Israeli Defense Force blew up those ambulances. Um, and eventually the communication line was lost. And um, just a couple of days ago, they found her decomposed body next to the decomposed bodies of her parents. Um, I think I am here to center her life. It is not to say that her life is worth more than the life of any of the Israeli hostages or any of the Israelis who were killed on October 7th. But I'm here to state that her life is worth no less. And given the fact that my own country, where my tax dollars go, is materially responsible for the murder of this girl, I feel that I have a moral responsibility to center her life. So whenever you have a conversation like this, you know, you always get people who ask the what about questions. What about Hamas? What about Palestinian leadership? What about... And there's a time and place to have that discussion. And I think you might find me as politely but firmly as possible insist that I'm here to center the life of Hind Rajab, of the 12,000 children like her, and to insist that their lives matter and that we have a moral responsibility to stop this unprecedented genocide against children. Um, Here's one of the children that some would call the lucky ones. She is living. Uh, the face of this little girl, Julia, and I admit, um, I have stayed up at nights thinking and dreaming about this little girl because she looks like my little girl. She could easily be my daughter. Um, there's a whole group of children in Palestine, in Gaza, who have this strange hashtag attached to them, WCNSF. And what that means is wounded child, no surviving family. No mother, no father, no sister, no brother, no aunt, no uncle, no grandfather, no grandmother. WCNSF means Every single person who knows and loves this child 
has been killed by the Israeli Defense Force. I personally know close family members, friends, who in the first month of this genocide lost 27 family members. There's entire families where the whole family tree has been wiped out. And if you're a person of faith, and if we're willing and able to ask those difficult moral questions, um, I consider Rabbi Heschel to be the greatest ethical voice of Judaism in the 20th century. A close friend of Dr. King's introduces him at Riverside. And um, Heschel, of course, famously came out against the Vietnam War, and so did Dr. King eventually. Uh, and Heschel, you know, asks this difficult question, uh, has our conscience become a fossil? Is all mercy gone? In a free society, some are guilty, all are responsible. And that question that Rabbi Heschel asks is, I think all of us who care about spiritual traditions also have to ask, and no, I'm not guilty for murdering any of the Israelis on October 7th, and I'm not guilty of murdering every single person in this precious child's life. But in a real way, and in a way that should make us feel uncomfortable and should make us want to turn away, if you take the tradition of Heschel and Martin and Malcolm and Jesus and Amos and Muhammad seriously, we're morally responsible. And it's so tempting to want to say, well, I'm just one person, what can I do? If you are guilty, all are responsible. Uh, I think as somebody who is committed to the task of divine love, that's my calling in life. That's what gives meaning to my life. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, if you've read the Torah, if you've read the New Testament, if you've read the Quran, you know this. Um, Jesus says, that which you do to the least of God's children, you do unto me. Uh, and there's no question that the least of these, the most impoverished, the hungriest, the refugee, the orphan, the widow, the needy, uh, Palestine is one of those places in the world where you can see that. As we speak today, the people of Gaza are reduced to eating grass and animal feed to survive. And there are hundreds of food trucks parked just outside the Rafah border, which the Israeli authorities do not allow to enter. So we are responsible. And part of my task, part of my calling to be here with people, understanding that emotions are heated. And I just pray that we can have a little bit less heat and a lot more light is to say, um, if this was your child, what would you want to see done? And she is your child. She is my child. She's all of our children. Whatever it is that you'd want to see done to your own children, if you want to see the bombing stop, if you want to see her hugged and loved, with a roof over her head and food in her belly and dignity in her bones, whatever we would wish for our own babies, we should be doing for other people's babies. I don't think that's such a radical perspective. I actually think it's fundamentally 
human. And I'm going to end and then turn it back to the two of you. Um, sometimes it's tempting to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, we are such spiritually illuminated people. We are the ones that have all the teachings and all the solutions, and we can do this and that. But you know, one of the most beautiful parts of our faith traditions is always that those closest to the pain are also closest to the solution. And ironically, it's oftentimes the very people who are the most oppressed who become our teachers, our great teachers in love, in justice, in dignity, in humanity. And I want to end with this footage that um, People in the US haven't had a chance to see this very much, but virtually everybody from the global south has seen this. Um, this is a grandfather. He's the man in the turban. Uh, Khalid is his name. And um, he had a granddaughter named Reem, and he is holding her dead body. Um, she's passed away. She's been killed by another Israeli bombing. And he just keeps repeating this phrase, Ruha Ruhi. Ah, she is the soul of my soul. She is the spirit of my spirit. Um, it's okay to have anger at what is taking place. And I've got plenty of anger in me uh, as well. Sometimes against Netanyahu, sometimes against Hamas, sometimes against Biden, sometimes against the people who make these weapons. Uh, but I don't believe that anger by itself is going to have the last word. Uh, I want you to watch just a short video of Khaled um, putting down his beloved granddaughter, whom he's raising, and then I'll tell you what he's been doing since then. So, um, you know, this grandfather has become, I've never met him, I've never spoken with him, but he's become one of my own teachers in humanity because he would be completely justified if he spent the rest of his life in tears. Uh, he would be completely justified, even if he was filled with um, an anger that would be seething inside of him. Instead, what he's done is that he's already devoted his life in the last two, three months to going up to other people who have lost loved ones and connecting his pain to their pain. Um, He's going, I saw a video of him. He was visiting someone whose leg had been amputated. And you know this, there's no painkiller medication left in Palestinian hospitals. So doctors are having to perform amputations of legs and arms without any painkiller. Excruciating pain. Um, and then sometimes with that amputated leg, they're then displaced and they're having to walk on foot or with a wheelchair. 
um, a dozen miles, hopefully away from the bombing. And he's going up to people who've had legs amputated and he's telling them, your leg is waiting for you in paradise. <laughs> You're going to be reunited with that leg. Um, and there's a gentle smile on his face that frankly, I don't know if I am capable of. And I know that there are people of every faith tradition who are capable of this. Um, hate and anger and vitriol is cheap in our day and age. It receives an enormous audience. We live in an age of bombast. But none of those qualities are divine. Um, the great Rumi at one point says, fear is not a divine quality, but love is. So I'm going to pause here, my friends. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to tell anyone whether they are Israeli or Palestinian or Jewish or Christian or Muslim of every faith and no faith at all, that they should not be angry. Uh, we're all angry. <laughs> if you didn't have anger, you might want to check your pulse. And we might be angry over different things. I don't doubt that there might be some of our friends gathered here who are angry at the fact that I've shown pictures of three Palestinians and not shown pictures of an Israeli. Anger has its place. I want to know if we are capable of the love that washes over us, washes over our community, washes over our neighborhood, washes over our people, and then doesn't stop there. It uh, keeps washing over the whole of humanity, every last blade of grass, every tree, every butterfly, every bird, every last burnt down olive tree, every wave of the ocean, and then insists that we're in this together, that our lives are intimately wrapped up together, and either we go up together or we're going to come down together but we're in this together. Just take a moment to stay in silence, just to take all this in before we add more words. Just a moment to feel, to grieve, to, to let it in. Send has been bringing spiritual teachers of many different traditions now for 15 years. And in the last four months, I've been so thirsty, so hungry to read teachings, to find teachings that speaks to the heart, speaks to the, this moment of so much suffering and pain. So what you're bringing here, Amit, is, is really... Uh, Medicine. It's medicine for, for our broken hearts. And also, yeah, keep, may our hearts keep breaking. I I think there is medicine in that. That that's so if I would have to ask a question is We're held by love. This is all love. How do, how do you reconcile? How do you see so much suffering and pain and yet know that this is love too? Absolutely. Well, you know, there's a reason that, um, at least in my tradition, we're told that uh, in, in his, in her infinite mercy, God chose to send, um, we're given these outrageous numbers, 124,000 prophets and messengers, uh, sometimes even bigger numbers, um, and that there's never been a people to whom God did not send uh, a messenger. And then on top of that, you have these lovers of God, these friends of God. 
And each of them has got their own style. <laughs> They've got their own vibe going on and they don't sound like each other. Um, they speak differently. So to go back again to that most prophetic of Jewish voices, Rabbi Heschel, he says at one point, prophets are not cool. Prophets are not smooth. They're not popular. Um, they're not polished. So he says at one point, the voice of the prophet comes like a scream in the middle of the night because your heart has burst open so much that you know unless you do something, rocks are going to cry out. Mm. And you see the suffering of the children. You see the suffering of the widows, of the poor, the needy, the orphan, uh, the stranger, right? And of course, um, you don't have to flip very far in the Bible to see, be kind to the stranger for you yourselves were once strangers, right? That identifying with the suffering of someone that at the moment we've come to identify as the enemy or the stranger. Um, what a profoundly powerful and spiritually transformative lesson would it be if instead of operating from that place of a fear-based approach, which is, that's the realm of politics. Politicians know how to appeal to us at the level of fear. That's why they're not our teachers. There's better ones and worse ones, but in the words of one of the great Libyan mystics, Omar Mukhtar, they are not our teachers. <laughs> we have teachers in this tradition. Um, what a powerful moment would it be if on one hand you could have, let's say, someone like Netanyahu, who is deeply unpopular amongst Israelis, even as they support this horrible war. How powerful would it be if we had more Jewish spiritual teachers, and we do, and we do, Jewish Voices for Peace, and many other teachers, they're my teachers, <laughs> who would say things like, there's probably never been a people more perpetually displaced than Jews in the last 2,000 years. They have been hated almost everywhere that they have gone, discriminated against almost everywhere that they have gone. And if there's one people on earth who would and could and should understand how painful it is to be displaced, forcibly displaced, driven away from the lands that your ancestors have been farming, it would be the Jews. And how powerful would it be, and I know how powerful it is for me, when I go to not demonstrations for this group or for that group or against that group, but for life, for justice, for dignity, for love, for peace, for wholeness, for food, for water. And who do I see at the forefront of every demonstration I go? Jewish Voices for Peace. Right? That gives me hope. That gives me life. Um, and they say that, you know, in the suffering of Palestinians, we see echoes of our own suffering. And then some of the mystics bring the love in their own way. I was recently reading this simple line of poetry, and this was, you know, four and a half months of tears and nightmare and activism and anger and a brokenheartedness. And I read this line uh, from Rumi in which he simply says, I know you're tired. And I was like, I am. <laughs> I'm exhausted, and I am sitting in the safety of my own home, and I am broken and breaking every day. He says, I know you're tired. Come, this is the way. Love is the way. Love is not just the goal. It's not just a destination. 
it is the very path that we have to walk. This is the way. Can we, do we dare have the audacity of insisting on love for all, enmity for none? And that begins in a moment of genocide in a moment of conflict by stopping the action that is bringing harm to others. If you were walking down the street and you saw an adult beating a child, you don't just keep walking. If you have a heart and soul and a conscience, you walk over. You ask, oh, honey, are you okay? And if needed, you grab the hand of that person who is hurting the child. I don't see any difference when that child is on the other side of the street or across the global village. Uh, and here, the prophets have something to teach us. You know, the blessed prophet Muhammad, um, you know, he says at one point, come to the aid of your sister and your brother, whether he is oppressed or the oppressor come to their aid and the people were very confused and they said oh messenger of allah would that we could give our lives for you we totally get it of how we would come to the aid of someone who's oppressed but pray tell how do we how do we help the oppressor why do we help the oppressor and he says you help the oppressor by stopping him, right? It's one of my wishes. This sounds like a paradoxical thing to say when there is 27,000 killed Palestinians, 70,000 injured Palestinians, 2 million displaced Palestinians, where we are on the verge, if not already, in famine, and perhaps worse plans for ethnic cleansing still to come from the deranged leaders of that country. It may sound like a strange thing to say, I wish and pray for the people of Israel to be free from the tyranny of oppression, to be free from the tyranny of occupation. Indoctrination. Indoctrination and this fear based trauma that is inflicted upon them. It is, to use that word that's sometimes a little trendy nowadays, it is weaponizing the history and the memory of a real Jewish trauma of anti-Semitism to legitimize and justify having held a people occupied and oppressed for decades and decades. There is a better way. Come, I know you're tired. There is a better way. And that way is a way of love, a way of justice, and a way that insists where we're trying to get to is a promised land where every Jew, every Christian, every Muslim, man, woman, gay, straight, rich, poor, every faith and no faith can have exactly and identically the same set of rights, the same set of responsibilities, the same set of privileges. Is that such a radical notion? We call it a secular democracy. <laughs> it's a goal in many countries. I don't think we're doing all that great with that goal in my own country. But that's what I work on here. And if that's what the people of Palestine and the people of Israel would want to work towards, I would come to their aid. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I have found myself many times in a place of righteousness where I lose the love. How does one um, 
fight. I like to use the word fight, but maybe it's not the right word for justice. Well, um, still being in connection, still recognizing the primacy of love. What is the practice? What are the teachings that can help us? Um, because that righteousness, oh, I know the truth. I Because I've seen the suffering in West Bank. I've seen, I've been there. I've sat with women have, who have been tortured in prisons. I've seen the pain, mothers who've lost their children, boys that have been shot in the knees and on a wheelchair for the rest of their lives. How do I let that not make me righteous, but be in connection with love. How about if we start by saying that maybe sometimes the most powerful, the most prophetic thing that we can do is to actually not speak, but to sit with someone and to assure them that we are a witness to their suffering that they do not suffer alone. Um, you know, this savior complex, and there's many versions of it. There's the American savior complex. There's the white savior complex. I know um, there's a male savior complex where, you know, um, my wife sometimes comes to me and she's sharing things that she's struggling with. And my first response is, well, you know, if we just do this and this and this, it would get better. And she's actually not sharing in order for me to offer the solution. She wants me to witness. And that's a really hard thing for a straight man to do, is to shut up and be silent and witness. Um, and what I find to be, and I'm even seeing this in some of um, the questions that we're getting coming in. Sometimes what we want to do is to have someone witness my suffering, our suffering, the suffering of the people that we identify with. And that's completely understandable. I think it would take an extraordinarily cruel heart to tell a human being or a community who is in pain to tell them uh, your suffering is not real. And what we tend to see in our own day and age is a lot of what some people would call whataboutery. Mm -hmm. right? uh, what about those people? What about my people? What about, um, what if for one moment we could Pause. I'm not saying dismiss, just hold it and set it right here for a second. The names and labels associated with the suffering, right? This is Palestinian suffering, Israeli suffering, Jewish suffering, Arab suffering, white suffering, black suffering, and instead see us in that most human of places, human suffering. Uh, this is the suffering of something that may no parent ever, ever, ever have to witness of a parent burying their child. Um, I don't know if there's a worse pain than that in the world. I didn't think there was a worse pain than that until I saw the footage of a Palestinian father carrying a trash bag with what was left of his child. He was picking up body parts so that he could bury them. Um, I would hope that we can begin with some notion of witnessing each other's pain. And all you have to do is to watch some of the presentations from, I've seen presentations from the mothers and from the brothers of Israeli hostages perhaps still held by Hamas, perhaps. Perhaps some of them have also been killed by this genocidal bombing 
of the Israeli military. But if you listen to those grieving parents and brothers presenting on Israeli TV, there's both brokenheartedness and anger. Witness it. Sit with it. See them as human beings. We would be no different. If it was my brother, my son, my daughter, my wife. And then expand your circle of compassion beyond yourself. None of us have a monopoly on love. I might think that my daughters are the most beautiful daughters in the whole world. And I'm right. <laughs> and I recognize that the father, the mother of every other daughter in the world is entitled to think the same way. It doesn't make me less of a lover of my children to grant that other people also love their children. So here's what Rumi says about how our brokenness comes out of only caring about the suffering of our people, right? So here's what he says. Uh, he says, you're clutching with both hands to this myth of a you and an I, this notion, this fiction of a you and an I, our whole brokenness is because of this. Our whole brokenness is not just because of a notion that I am an I and you are a you. Like there's actually something really beautiful about people having distinctions and particularities. Um, I sometimes give the analogy that I really like Persian food and I like sushi. And I like Mexican food, but I wouldn't want to put Persian food and sushi and Mexican food in a blender and blend them together. I like the distinctness of the flavors, and I like the distinctness of the languages, the musical tradition, the clothing, the customs, the poetry. So we're not talking about the erasure of what makes us you and I. But we're talking about that notion of the clutching to it, where we think that only our people ultimately are worthy. Only our suffering fundamentally counts. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel to about 40 countries around the world. That's one of the few true universals that I've seen. Everywhere I've gone, people love their babies and they want a good future for them. And they want a roof over their head and enough food for them. And most of the time, they want them to marry someone just like them. <laughs> These are some of the only true universals that I've seen. Um, and, and it's they... very hard to ident ask people to identify with not just the neighbor, but the person that they've come to see as the enemy, as long as we're living in that fear culture, as long as we treat love as if it is somehow a commodity of scarcity. And I think instead our teachers are telling us that love is in a great abundance, that by you extending love to the neighbor and the stranger, it does not diminish you, it might actually expand you. And there's a caveat. <laughs> and, um, you know, that caveat is one that uh, I think is also important. Um, it's also worthy of being taken into consideration. Um, and I'm very deeply, deeply um, enamored of the Black prophetic tradition, the tradition that gives us not just a Martin Luther King and a Malcolm X, but um, a Vincent Harding and a James Baldwin and a Tracy Chapman and, and others, 
And Jimmy Baldwin says at one point, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. I think that's a really powerful and beautiful point. We can disagree and still love each other, provided you're not actively trying to kill me. <laughs> At that moment, actually the most radical, revolutionary, loving thing that I can do is to protect myself, protect my community. Um, and we've been talking a lot about Palestine and Israel, but I would just love to zoom back a little bit and to say that if you start scanning around our little tiny planet, we're seeing in so many countries, including in our own United States of America, the rise of these fear-based popular movements, which are no longer fringe movements. Yes, this is about Trump, but it's not only about Trump. He's a beneficiary as opposed to just a creator. But we're seeing these kinds of movements in France, in the Netherlands, not to mention India and many other places around the world where politicians are using this language of fear and intimidation and anger towards an oppressed minority to come to power. And this is really one of our great challenges as a human community right up there with our environmental challenges and, and other ones. But we have a way and we do have a remedy and that remedy is love. And I never want us to lose sight of that. Mm. <laughs> I, so refreshing, is that? It's so refreshing to find, uh, to hear a spiritual response to this. Because the, the silence of the spiritual community has been deafening. And thank you so much for for reminding us that. that we can stand for life, for the sacredness on, for each and every life. If we yeah. cannot stand for that, what happened to our humanity? That's what we need to ask. What happened? You know, thank, thank you both for, for that. And I will say this, um, you know, now that we've had almost five months, um, I admit that I've also tried to um, go through a series of emotions and thoughts about my own experiences with um, many, many spiritual teachers. Um, and it was and is and remains disappointing to see so many teachers whom I love and have benefited from and not here to name names but some of whom have spent their whole life talking about trauma and vulnerability and suffering. And then we get to this moment and it's crickets. And so it makes me wonder like, okay, so where was all that talk about vulnerability when you got 2 million people being displaced and 30,000 people almost being killed? And what does that mean? And it certainly doesn't apply to all. Uh, I know Gabor Mate, who's a friend to you all and a teacher to me, um, I've been so deeply moved by his humanity, his compassion. Um, truth-telling. Truth-telling and, and that ability to recognize that suffering is not a zero-sum game though he also attempts to speak the truth as best he sees it. Um, and I've also seen so many other spiritual teachers, yoga teachers, meditation teachers, whom I'd never heard of before, 
who all of a sudden are rising up and, and speaking for things. So uh, I know that we do live in this age of cancel culture. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of certain parts of it. I admit that I'm still disappointed when I see people that I would have expected to have said something, done something. But if you're catching me on one of my better days, today's a good day that <laughs> I get to be with you all. Um, I would say that I try to have it be a call in culture as opposed to a call out culture. And to tell people, look, I understand that you're afraid. I understand that you might be afraid of being called lots of things. Um, and many of us are called lots of things. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, this is about one of the great saints of Islam, um, Imam Ali, who is the closest companion to the Prophet Muhammad. And there was once a guy who came to him, and the guy secretly hated him, loathed him. Um, but he was kind of a hypocrite. So to his face, he was like, you are the most luminous saint of God ever. You are the most beautiful human being ever. But in his heart, he thought, like, you're just a, you know, staff for Allah, like piece of you know what. Um, and Ali, who, of course, has that ability to read hearts, he looks at him and he says, um, I am not as beautiful and as luminous as what you say with your tongue. But I know that I'm also not as bad as what you hold me to be in your heart. Um, and there are times where many of us, and I'll speak for myself here, I stand up and I have talked about some of these children that I talked about today. I talked about Julia, I talked about Reem, Ruha Ruhi, soul of my soul. Uh, he calls her the soul of my soul because, you know, he is his daughter's daughter. So she's doubly his soul. His daughter is his soul and his granddaughter is the soul of my soul also. I've talked about them and I've just made the observation that they are, these children are precious and they deserve to be saved and not bombed, and not oppressed, and not occupied. And in response, you know, people call me like the worst kind of, you're an anti-Semite. Um, you know, when you're, when you're attacked like that, I think it's always good to take a deep breath and to pause. Um, every spiritual teacher in history, if they've done real work, they've always also been attacked. So you don't want to take it as a badge of honor. You don't want to be out there trying to get people provoked. Um, but, you know, I've gone back and I've looked at what it is um, that Martin used to do. And uh, when Martin came out against the Vietnam War, people called him a sellout. Um, New York Times called him a demagogue, and um, Washington Post, I think, said that he had outlived his usefulness to his people. Um, and they shot him a year to the day after his Riverside Church speech. What he would say in the last year of his life when people would call him names was just simply this, I'm sorry, sir, you don't know me. Um, maybe you've never really known the depth of my commitment. Maybe you've never really known that for me, the lives of Black folk in this country are intrinsically tied to the lives of Asian folk in Vietnam because we're children of one God. Um, and I have to be very clear in my heart. I'm not speaking about anybody else here, just for myself that when I speak about that each one of these children, to use Christian language, is a child of God, to use Muslim language, has the breath of Allah breathed into them, to use the words of Muhammad, uh, is more holy than the temple of God, 
if someone hears that as anti-Semitism, what that says to me is that they have gone to the point where their notion of Jewish safety can only be conceivable through the domination and oppression of another group of humanity. And that is a tragedy for a tradition that has always been based ethically and the fact that the love of God is tied to the love of humanity, starting with the least of these. So, you know, my hope is that a lot more spiritual teachers will come and speak out. Um, my hope is that may God bless Jewish Voices for Peace. I hope we will see more of them. I was very encouraged to see a thousand black ministers yeah. call for a ceasefire. Uh, I've always had this sense, America is a weird country. <laughs> It's a strange country. It's my country, but it's a strange country. Um, and Christianity does have a particular role. Um, I mean, people, your audience will probably know this, but maybe not so many. The vast majority, by a factor of 20 or 30, the vast majority of Zionists in America are not Jews. They're Christian Zionists. They have a particularly strange form of 19th century theology where you know they think that a nation of Israel, modern nation state of Israel uh, has to exist for a thousand years before Jesus comes back and then most of the Jews are going to either be killed or be forced to convert. Um, if we could see more and more Christian ministers, rabbis, imams come up and to say we're not concerned with whether it is Jews doing the bombing or Arabs doing the bombing or Indians doing the bombing. We are children of a God whose love encompasses you the way that a mother's womb holds an unborn child. Uh, we are against bombing anywhere and everywhere. We are for <laughs> holding of our children. We are for freeing all the prisoners. Yes, the Israeli prisoners and the Palestinian prisoners. We are for a roof over everybody's head. It takes the push of a button to destroy, to blow up an entire apartment complex. What they're blowing up is not just cement, it is home. And there's a difference between a house and a home, and that difference is memory, that difference is love. So my hope is that we will see, this is a call in, not a call out, and that we can, will see more and more people. I just wanted to add here also the Mother Earth that is receiving so much poison every day from these bombings. That is the eradication of the olive trees, the trees and the killing and the... of camel and sheep and all the animal and yeah. destruction of, of all vegetation. The real home, our mother, she's been... Uh, the only mother, the, the fundamental mother that, that we do have. And, you know, um, some of these olive trees in Palestine were here when Jesus walked on the earth. Well, you know. Right? Um, and... You know, you talked at one point about teachers and what do these teachings have to offer us? Um, I love to go to sacred places whenever I visit a place. And for me in North America, one of the most sacred places, there's a point to this, I promise, um, is Muir Woods, north of the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. Well, gorgeous, beautiful, sacred ancient, ancient 600-year-old, 1,000-year-old redwood trees. And the last time that I was there, I was so moved to see that these trees, which are, you know, 150, 200 um, feet up in the air, their roots are only six to eight feet deep. 
right? They're so majestically tall, but they actually have a very shallow root system. So how can that be? How can they survive for all these hundreds and hundreds of years, for all the storms, all the rain and all the wind and all the hurricanes that might come? Well, they've learned the lesson because there are teachers. These trees are better spiritual teachers than 90% of the people on Instagram. They've learned the lesson that we as human beings still have to learn, which is that they've learned to entangle their roots in one another. And that the minute that one of these trees starts to topple over, the other ones catch it. And so the message is, don't you dare fall. And if you fall, we all fall, but you're not falling alone. And that's what I want to see us as a human community rise to. That's what I hope we can become capable of, is whenever, anywhere on this small planet that you see human beings suffering, I want to see us reach out. And look, it is easy to give in to despair. It's easy to feel like we're living in the end of days and the worst of times and the worst of people are ruling over us. I'll tell you one of the things that gives me hope. And my mama and my baba, they lived me, they named me um, Omid, which means hope. So I'm by nature and by choice, person given to hope. Um, it gives me hope when I see two million people demonstrating in Indonesia. It gives me hope when I see yesterday 100 kids in Stanford, uh, when I see hundreds of thousands of people in London and in Copenhagen and in Australia, and they're doing it not out of animosity, but out of love. Out of love for people to whom they're not related ethnically, racially, linguistically, or religiously, but they see them as human. And I think what I would say, especially for any of the friends gathered here, anybody who might be listening to this later, if they've sat through an hour and 10 minutes of this conversation and they still feel like, yeah, but what about? And I don't feel like you've adequately sat with the pain and the hurt of my community. You might be right. Each of us has a contribution. Let us see what would happen as a human community if we let go of this clutching to this you and I, and we insist that love, that dignity, that air, that food are not in scarcity. There's enough for all of us. What if we actually hold on to the faith that people come into this world not born to hate, but born to connect, born to love, born to touch, born to love glance? I have to believe that we're born that way. This other way doesn't seem to be working out so well. We can never, never be safe in separation. Yeah. yeah, That's where that, you know, that beautiful non-duality in your name, I think, comes in so, so perfectly. It's not just about, you know, our separation from the perceived natural world. Um, I mean, Rumi says at one point, you think that earth and water and air and fire are things, but no, they're all living. They're all alive in the sight of God. So it's the non-duality part for me. It's not just about changing our relationship to nature, changing our relationship to ourselves, that the body and the spirit are linked, fundamentally intertwined, um, but also that we as communities are wrapped up with one another. 
Thank you, everyone. We will be continuing offering conversations and space to be together in, in grief, in conversation. So please keep tuning in. And... and hopefully soon we will have also a meeting in which we share joy. And celebrate. And celebrating the beauty of each and every creature in this planet. All. And dance and poetry. And poetry, yeah. In, in Palestine, when we were in the West Bank, we kept asking people, how do you survive? How do you? And they, they say they have a poem, a poet who said, between the funeral of two martyrs, celebrate life. Celebrate life whenever you can. That's what keeps us going. And in their honor, may we celebrate life as well. That is Amen. here. And Amen. nourishing us all. Amen. May it be that we get to see a song and dance and poetry where with one ear we'll hear our Palestinian sisters and brothers singing, we teach life, sir. And from the other ear, we hear our Jewish friends talking about the chai, uh, the living, the life itself. And, uh, may life upon life and light upon light. And uh, may we be a small participant.